The Rise Today Inspirational Podcast is brought to you by two relentless health warriors. Dr. Erica Harris, an empowered mindset health expert, who is the passionate founder of risetoday.com. And Megan Hubner, an entrepreneurial marketing strategist and founder of meganhubner.com. These two inspirational forces have truly thrived through adversity and are here to empower you to do the same. Together, they serve to open up the conversation about hardship and to move you to greatness through your adversities. Learn more at risetoday.com forward slash podcast. Now, let's get started. Let's rise today, right here, right now. Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome back to the Rise Today Inspirational Podcast. We are so happy to have you back with us, and we hope you found so much inspiration in our last show where we featured Andrew, a very courageous, very bold, and very brave cancer warrior. He's a loving young dad and husband, and he is with us to open up the conversation um, and share his raw jury, journey about cancer and to inspire others to rise as well. We truly hope you found inspiration on that journey. And today, we humbly welcome Beth Nagel. She is the founder of BethAnnNagel.com, and she is the author of Cry of My Heart. She is here today to open up the conversation about infertility and adoption and take us through her struggles and how she stayed the course in her story of welcoming three beautiful children really overnight. So welcome to the show, Beth. We're so happy to have you here with us, Beth. Megan, will you help me welcome Beth to our show? Yes, welcome, Beth. We're so thrilled to have you here. Now, Beth and I actually connected beautifully through social media, which is such an amazing tool for connection these days, especially with the current climate that we're in. Um, and the time of this, this, at the time of this show, it's actually November. So we're recording this episode in November and November and October are actually foster care and adoption awareness month. So we thought this is actually perfect timing to bring this episode to light, to bring, you know, attention to the situation of, of adoption and foster care. So welcome Beth. We're thrilled to have you here. Thanks. I'm glad I have a chance to share. Yes. So, you know, you've got a house full now of three children that start from nine and range up to 14, I believe. Yes. And so obviously your house was always not that full. Take us back, if you would, you know, Erica touched on infertility and, you know, kind of take us through your, some of the trials and tribulations that you went through to get to where you are today. Well, um, my husband and I got married later in life. Um, I was 34 and he was 39. So we knew if we wanted children, we should, you know, get started right away. Um, and we knew within a matter of months that we were butting up against infertility. Um, and so we started out with um, right away with doctors, specialists, lots of um, drugs, medications that I would have to take. And um, it really altered my personality and mm -hmm. I'm really lucky that my husband stayed because it was, it was really that bad. And um, they just couldn't find a solution, couldn't find a solution. We were running out of money. Our marriage was so tense. I just, I said to him one day, it's not going to do any good for me to get pregnant if our marriage splits up because we are so at odds with each other all the time. So we made the decision to shut the door on fertility treatments and leave it as a, if it happens, it happens. If it does not, um, that's the way life is gonna be for us. Um, it took some time. It was at least a year before we were both on that same page. Um, we would go, you know, kind of back and forth. And then people started, you know, <laughs> I've decided that people are uncomfortable with your discomfort. Mm -hmm. And so they will say that. something to try to be more comfortable with your situation. Um, and I had to land there because otherwise it just felt like everybody's picking on me, you know, yeah. kind of like a high school version. Yeah. Um, so that helped me let it go a, a bit. And I think that was mostly because the infertility, although they couldn't identify why, um, it was still attributed to the female 
because there's only one sign that a male is infertile and that was not the case. So that meant female infertility and um, it was hard. I can remember crying over those stupid pink sticks and <laughs> my husband will come pounding on the bathroom for what's the matter? What happened? Did you hurt yourself? And it, it was, I can laugh now, but it was a really difficult time. Tell me Beth, tell me what were those emotions deep within with those pink sticks? Um, like, I'm doing something wrong. What is wrong with me? Maybe that I don't deserve to have children. What is wrong with me that I can't get it right? Maybe I should be eating vegan. It was, it was all me. And, you know, everyone is their own worst critic. And so that it just mm -hmm. became a, I, I was like a punching bag to myself. And of course, that's why I would be so much sensitive if my husband dared breathe wrong or chew too loudly it was of course. just awful so you're left you're left questioning your worthiness you're left questioning your actions and um your your responsibility in this right and so how did you how did you overcome those emotions and how did you let yourself experience those emotions to then overcome that you found a really great therapist honestly. okay so your um, talk therapy was very helpful most definitely. Um, she was so helpful and um, trying to help me come around to this, you know, if if you had a child who was struggling with these same emotions, would you agree with them? Would they, would you say, yes, you're screwing this up, you're getting it wrong? You know, you would never say that to another person. And um, so I actually had to work really hard to give myself a break because the, so important. the tapes come. And they come unbidden. And at some point we have to say, press pause, press eject, whatever. These, these just have to stop. That's so important. Switching from a point of judgment to a point of compassion. And you mentioned something earlier that I really want to talk on. People being uncomfortable with your discomfort. And that's so true, right? And um, we find ourselves amidst this society of people who always want to fix everything when we're uncomfortable. And sometimes we just need to hold space, right? And hold that space where somebody can sit with their emotions and that can be okay. Yeah. So that's really an important reflection that you made. Thank you. Yes. It's uh, I, I learned it from a minister I worked with who called it the ministry of presence. Mm, that it. is, you know, the idea in other cultures where they will go and sit with a person and just sit. Yeah. If that person wants to speak, they can. If they don't, you just sit. And there's, there's, I find that so much more powerful than the little old lady who taps me on the shoulder and asks me if I'm sure I'm doing it right. You know, um, you, just creating that space to be yes. vulnerable. <laughs> creating that yeah. space to be vulnerable is so yeah. important, you know, for, for our own selves to do it within ourselves. Yes. And yet to do it for those that we're also supporting, just creating that safe space, as I like to call it, to let someone experience whatever they're going through. I think mm -hmm. that's really, really important. Okay. And I think it's also too, so important to recognize that emotions are not wrong. Emotions are never wrong. They're a feeling. And if you feel that need to cry, or if you feel that need to be mad or sad or jealous or whatever it is, it's still an emotion that you need to process. And so just allowing yourself, like you said, we're the worst cr critics for ourselves to give yourself permission to be like, you know what, I'm going to be in this. It's okay. It's an emotion. It's going to pass. Yes. So then you took time, Beth, it sounds like, and you took time through this process of awareness, I'm guessing, and really reflection where you and your husband got on the same page, it took about a year, you were saying, what are other tools that you were doing to stay on this page together so that your marriage didn't fall further apart? Um, well, we are people of faith. And so my husband, bless him, you guys, he's a gem. He's, <laughs> maybe one day you'll meet him. He's so amazing. Um, uh -huh. he, he said, um, we just need to pray. We just need to pray together every day. Doesn't matter what we pray for. Doesn't matter what we pr say, but we're doing it together. And kind of that um, three strand cord, you know, that kept us bonded together. And um, we both, I, I actually did say to my husband at one point through tears and this desperation that I wanted to give him children, I said to him, um, if there's someone else you're interested in, I would graciously back away so that you can be with her and have children. 
And that's how wow. much this was my fault. And of course, then he's like, okay, no, we're not going this path. And then he said, come on, we're going to pray. And um, it, we ended up holding on to that all the way through finalizing the adoption of our children uh, because we were able to, you know, pray for the kids, for, for our children to come to us. That meant they had to go through a great tragedy. Mm -hmm. And how do you pray for God to give you someone's kids? If that means, you know, this person is mm -hmm. losing their kids. So we carried that throughout. Um, and frankly, we don't do it nearly as often. And I think that's probably because now that I'm a mother, I collapse into bed about 8.30 at night. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just done being awake. So, so tell us the struggles. Um, once you've both decided to adopt, tell us the struggles um, moving forward on that path. Um, we first approached an organization. Um, in our area, asking questions. We didn't really know how adoption worked. Um, we just knew that if we wanted children, this was the route we'd have to go. And um, they very abruptly informed us that by the time we were matched with an infant and approved and licensed and finalized, my husband would be too old because he was approaching 45. Wow. And and we struggled with that. Like we took it personally yeah. that, that they could say, um, I would rather this child be in a bad situation than be with someone old, you know? And mm -hmm. um, so that was a journey all in itself. So we had a few months of forget it, screw it, <laughs> just not going to do it. And, um, and then I had a very good friend who, um, she was actually my seventh grade choir teacher. And oh. um, we now live in the same town and reconnect. And she has one biological child and one adopted child. And she said, adoption does not have to be that. And I actually started learning that people in my life who just don't really talk a whole lot about foster care and adoption, these people um, had done that. They had done what's called foster to adopt. Um, I met a woman who had adopted six children in addition to her three biological children. Um, and I met another woman whose uh, her family adopted seven children in addition to their two biological children. And so we said, let's check this out. Now, my husband grew up um, with his parents doing foster care. They took in foster kids. And he did not remember it as a good experience. Mm -hmm. um, and this, uh, you know, this was going to be long before anybody made the connection that um, the behaviors that these kids um, are displaying are not a child being a brat, but a child who has undergone so much trauma, they don't know how they feel, what to do with those feelings. Um, so it was not a good experience for him. And so he flat out said, we are not doing foster care. We are not. Um, so in the state of Michigan, you can actually just loss license to adopt. You do not have to license to foster. Most people go the, the route of foster care. The child moves in with them. They have them, you know, for maybe a couple of years. The judge says, okay, the mom's not getting it together. So, mm -hmm. you know, now you can adopt these kids. And um, my concern for myself was that I would get attached to a child who would then be returned home. Um, so we said no foster. And so the process of going through um, an adoption, at least in uh, the state of Michigan, um, you have these, you basically have to write an autobiography and they are going to turn your life inside out and upside down. They're going to go into the closets and they're going to look for bad guys and they're going to um, question, um, you know, the, every uh, pill that you put in your mouth. And um, I've, I've heard that from a lot of people because, um, I've, I'm also a licensed foster parent and we are awaiting a placement as well. And right. so we have, you know, in all the research I've done, that is, seems to be a barrier. And so I know that when we were talking earlier, one of the things that you wanted to highlight for people that are considering or potentially in your situation is that just to how to find, how to get over the fear to find the beauty. Yes. So what did you use at that point when they are 
pulling all the drawers open in your house and investigating every prescription that you have, what did you use? What was the tool that you used at that point to say, we are, we're going for this. We we're going ahead. Um, at that point, I didn't actually do a very good job. Frankly, that was not yet my point of overcoming. Um, I discovered through that how easily we can get into a victim mentality. Mm -hmm. And that, that was later. That was you actually- must have, You must have felt violated though. You must have felt yes. violated to a yes. point, right? When everyone's scrutinizing you, excuse me, to that degree. And frankly, all parents should have to be scrutinized before they have children, <laughs> right? But no. that sense of fairness as to why you just couldn't have children naturally and why you'd have to undergo that scrutiny, you must, I could, I could imagine you feeling violated. Yes. Yeah. And because I already, you know, we talked about the tapes during infertility, those did not yet change. It was more of, it seems that at, up until that point, my life question was, what's wrong with me? What is so wrong with me that all of these X, Y, Z down the alphabet? keeps happening. Um, so it was actually after we finalized or after we um, were approved, the social worker came into our house. She did not look at the things that I had done, like taking a little blade and scraping all the way around the corner in the kitchen between the countertop and the wall. She didn't look and see that I had done that. And I thought, they've worked so hard. How can, how can she not just say, wow, you have a really clean kitchen counter, you know, it just didn't. Um, so it was then on the in-between as we waited um, to be matched. They do not look for kids for parents. They look for parents for kids. Mm -hmm. So the difference is they want to make sure these kids are happy. They don't frankly care if I'm happy because I'm an adult and that's my choice where these kids, who are they going to fit? Like you're, you know, if, if you have a little boy who says, well, I just, I would really like to have parents who were um, into sports and can take me to sporting events. And then the, you know, then the agency matches them with somebody. Yes, they're going to be loved, but you're never going to touch a basketball as long as you live because we're musicians or whatever, you know. So they're more concerned about the kids than they are us. And, and rightfully I can so. See, rightfully so. I can see yeah. why they're more concerned about the children, but I can also see on the flip side of how hard that would be for you, navigating mm -hmm. all that you're navigating in that time and just so desperately wanting to create this family. Waiting. So with, with, all, waiting? with all these barriers around you. Yeah. <laughs> And so what, what helped you waiting? What helped you through this, really? Um, my, I don't know, my husband. Um, I love that at that point, we were so on board with this together. Um, it feels less lonely. Um, and reaching out to these friends who were just around me and for whatever reason, I hadn't realized spending time with them, watching them, with their children, um, hearing the stories of just how challenging um, trauma parenting can be and looking at them and, and seeing that the match was so good. Um, that made me willing to wait, made me willing to accept the process. That so you're holding the vision yes. of where you guys yeah. are really going as a family. Yes. And through this community of support that you created for yourself, which is so important during these moments, really important. It really is. And, you know, I, I think that there are things that, things in life that if we come to the place of realizing we can't do it alone is actually a better place to be than in the place of, I must fix this. It's on me. Yeah. Um, I call that um, bootstraps thinking or pull myself up by my bootstraps, you know, and there's a place for that. Um, there was a place for that with me in, in realizing I need to stop thinking like a victim because if you think like a victim, everything that goes wrong feels personal. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so absolutely. I had to say, I'm done being a victim. But then the rest of it, the journey of the waiting and the uncertainty and the um, what is our life going to look like? Maybe we went through all this work and none of it is going to 
do anything. All of that surrounded by a community of adoptive and foster parents that we were able to reach out to. It sounds like you really harnessed the power of vulnerability. Yes. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And the power of community. I think you had mentioned too, Beth, earlier that, um, you know, there were some people in your life that are just not there any longer. And that is kind of a choice that you made. And I thought that was so powerful because so often we surround ourselves by friends and family and, and our people in our community. And we just go through the habit of being with these people. But in actual fact, you, you had mentioned that you were getting some pushback from them and just different alignment of values and things as you guys went through this journey. Yes, most definitely. Um, people that I would never consider racist suggesting that we not adopt children of color um, because we're as Caucasian as you can get. Um, people who felt that we were not trusting God if we were giving up the pregnancy thing to adopt children. And um, yes, it, it was just not healthy. It wasn't healthy. You have to choose your circle. Definitely. Yeah. And yeah. we've, had to, we've had to continue to choose as we've gone forward as a family. Yeah. Um, That's so important during adversity, beautiful. but really, really throughout all points in life, right? To choose that community that builds us up and that doesn't pull us down on our paths. And sometimes that's a really hard choice, but to preserve our best interest, our own self-interest, we really need to do so. And so this, this strong community of support that you built and these tools of this talk therapy and your strong relationship with your husband in, in terms of keeping this communication open were really phenomenal skills and your gift of prayer um, that you pursued relentlessly, it sounds like, which is beautiful, really helped you navigate and overcome these questions of worthiness and self-blame that I hear that you were going through during this that I'm sure many of our listeners feel, whether it's infertility, not being able to, to create this family that they had already envisioned and always envisioned, whether it's facing cancer, whether it's facing career crisis, divorce, no matter what we face, we've all been there. After a bad breakup, we face questions of worthiness, right? And mm -hmm. these tools that you're sharing are profound in helping us all, whether again, it's infertility or any adversity we're facing. So form that community of support, be open about your journey, create this safe space of vulnerable to be vulnerable and harness the power mm -hmm. from being vulnerable. And this is all amazing, Beth, thank you. And you now have three beautiful children. We have three beautiful children. Um, when they came to us, they were eight, seven, and three, just turned three. Um, our wow. Youngest, they, our youngest was nine months old when they went into foster care. Um, and they were in a, a foster situation for two years um, until they were matched with us. And um, yeah, like as soon as the match was made and we said yes, it went forward full throttle, like no more wait, wait, wait. It, there wasn't a slow wow. speed up. It was just bam, here's your kids. You've got three. Um, you, you get three of them. You get, you know, be careful what you wish for going to be <laughs> overnight. Is there were nights when we would go to bed and be like, what have we done? Yeah. So Beth, can you tell me, because I, I, I'm unfamiliar with this process. Can you tell me, did you meet the children first or did they just arrive at your doorstep? We met them first. Um, okay. If you were doing foster care, yes. it would be a yeah. arrival at the doorstep. I see. Um, we, I, I kind of felt like dating. Um, I met my husband on the internet. So we did the, <laughs> well, let's talk on the phone first, you know, that kind of thing. And so it felt like dating. We got to go and meet them at a McDonald's near their foster home. And um, we share fond memories of that now. My son, who was seven at the time, saw this great big, huge six, five man walk into McDonald's. I mean, this guy, my husband, like he could have been a linebacker <laughs> um, and Carter hit under the table. He was, like, he was scared. And so now it's funny because, um, you know, my husband at the time said, well, Carter kind of looks more like a table to me than a kid, you know, and it, just that joking right away that he has. Um, and so, yeah, so we met them for about an hour and then they had to go home with their foster parents and then it was you know you can pick them up and take them to the park but we weren't allowed to bring them to our home 
um, because they didn't want the children to get hopeful and then something not work out. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of picking them up and going to the park, you know, for a picnic or um, some of the arcades in the area that um, is really, is really not our thing, but it was a, a great chance to just have fun with the kids and fun thing. Yeah. Um, fun things yes mm -hmm. and so then it builds up to um they get to stay for a weekend um and then once the um the people in the state of michigan who are i don't i don't know how to explain it our children were wards of the state they were nobody's children they were the state's children and so when that person said yes indeed these people may become their parents then they were um, to move in with us and they moved they finished school that year and moved in with us two days later wow amazing yes. and so you've they've been in your home now for six years yes okay yeah. um and anyone listening knows that parenting is really challenging at times and anyone who is listening that has experienced parenting children with trauma also knows that that is a separate component of challenge. And so can you share with us a little bit, you know, your, your book, The Cry of My Heart, I think Erica mentioned it earlier. I received this beautiful piece of mail the other day um, that was not a bill, but instead was actually Beth's brand new book um, called The Cry of My Heart. And it really highlights some of the struggles and challenges that you go through parenting children that have come from trauma so can you maybe elaborate on that or you know share a bit of how you guys successfully navigated for our listeners we learned very quickly that our children have been too through too much to soften anything they have to hear it straight and there are people who were in our lives who didn't feel that was good and so they're not in our lives but we watched how well that our communication and relationship opened up with our children when we were willing to say I really screwed up I I, I jumped to conclusions I walked into this room this is what I saw going on and so I yelled and I gotta tell you I'm sorry I screwed up but also walking into a room and saying this is not okay. This is why. And this is how we will move forward from that moment. And before we did that, there was a lot of crying. There was a lot of our middle daughter ran away from home for the first time when she was eight. It was the middle of February and she didn't have a coat. And it was because I had corrected her table manners and then went to my room to do something else. And when I came back, there was a note on the table. I'm sorry I destroyed our family. I'm just going to go find my birth mom um, over table manners. And so we learned to say to her, and, and even now, if I can speak with her in terms of correction without heavy emotion. So if there's anger, even if there's excitement, she's, she just can't receive it. And so I very much will say, Here's the situation. Here's why it's not okay. Here's how we're going to move forward. Any questions? Now, as they're getting older, we're doing more of, this is definitely not okay. <laughs> this is why it's not okay. What do you suppose we should do? Mm -hmm. But, you know, my son has, you know, what 14 year old does not have electronics battles with their parents. And um, he recently um, got caught doing something. And so I just went to him and I said, you know, I don't know if you realize this, but when you log into this thing, I get an email every time. <laughs> <laughs> and for him to immediately know, you know, I'm busted. And I said, how are we going to move forward from this? Because I refuse to fight with you. I refuse to fight with you. And I say that a lot to my kids. I refuse to fight. And he said, can you just have dad turn off the Wi-Fi for a while um, so that I'm not tempted to get on there? He would not have done that when he was seven. It has been a journey, most yeah. definitely, of trial and error, trial and error. Sometimes things work with one kid that do not work with another kid. Um, um, owning your own actions. 
right? Yes. And it sounds to me like you led by example mm -hmm. rather than leading by your words. And I think that's so important to it teach is. to all children, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like all children, but especially perhaps adopted kids need to hear that they have these boundaries, right? But that no matter what we're going through, no matter what adversities we're facing, together, we're going to get through it and giving that sense of security to them that mm. together strong, as you move forward, you can face anything together. But I think mm. reinforcing that so much, especially with kids coming in after all they've been through is what I'm hearing from you would be really important. Yes. I do remember the day that the therapist said to me, oh, well, he must be feeling really safe around you if he's willing to say that to you or do that to you. And I remember saying, I don't think I want him to feel that safe. Because <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. he's really, he, he needs a stinker. Well, pushing they all, the envelope. Uh, pushing the envelope, testing, retesting boundaries, those kinds of things. Um, one of the greatest challenges is being in a conversation with someone who doesn't get it and they think that they do. And so when I say my son this, and they say all kids do that, I would repair it with, okay, all kids might do that, but not all kids do it from a place of fear. Mm -hmm. You know, your kid probably is doing it out of defiance. Mine is terrified that I'm going to give him away for sneaking a granola bar you know mm -hmm. so there's that fear base and mm -hmm. um so that was one of the first things that we had to overcome was that it doesn't really do a whole lot of good to correct people and i think well, the that same, the same exact um concept of what we were talking about at the beginning of the show when everyone quote unquote wanted to fix you right mm -hmm. during these right feelings of unworthiness that you were going through with infertility. And mm -hmm. it's the same thing in this situation with our children. We often just need to give them that space yes. and hold that space, right? To let them feel these emotions. Um, can I ask a question though? Are they, um, are they reflective enough given everything they've gone through? Are they open with you about the degree of their trauma and a degree of the hardship and degree of the hard that they've experienced? My son, definitely. Um, he's the oldest. He was five when they went into care. Um, he can very vividly remember the police busting in the door, um, his mom screaming and crying, the social worker reaching over and yanking him from her arms. Um, he remembers that vividly and believes it's his fault to this day. Wow. Um, and so, yes, they will be very open with me if we're one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. um, with my son, uh, it's side by side, so we're both facing forward. That works for him. Mm -hmm. um, so gardening, I'll just, if I feel like talking to my son, I'll go out and start pulling weeds. And he, that somehow is signal to him that this is a good time to talk to mom. Yep, you're so right. I find the same thing on the ski lift. I find the same thing, even driving, driving right? Just when there's another, time. when there's another focus point for them, right? And it takes off a little bit of that, that intensity and that pressure, I think, when they can be more open. Really good point. Yes. And so um, I, I continue to affirm them in that they have permission to miss her. They have permission to long for her. They have permission to talk about her and think about her because there's a bond with that woman that will never, ever be broken. What's the point in trying to break that if it's only going to make things harder for my child and harder for our family relationship? So we've kind of, we've kind of minimized how we say it just so that we have a quicker saying and we have landed on, you are not required to love me, but you are required to respect me. And that's giving them the permission that they need. Um, frankly, I was not adopted and there were days when I really did not like my mother. You know? <laughs> <laughs> she had to give me room to not like her. <laughs> yeah. Well, Beth, yeah, I thank true. you so much for being here with us today. And I think you will resonate so much with our listeners who have experienced infertility or who are struggling with that right here and right now, facing those same feelings of 
lack of worthiness or questioning themselves as to what they did so wrong. We can do that, whether it's infertility or any adversity we face. And you have shared phenomenal tools for us all to overcome those feelings, to express those feelings, to have that safe space, to build this community of support, to encourage talk therapy. And um, you've been really inspirational today. I can't thank you enough. Thanks. Thank you so much for sharing. And your, and your children don't allow your adversity to make you a victim. I think that's that's right. I love I love that you own everything, right? Mm-hmm. And and yes. do not take that victim role, no matter right. what comes your way. It's it's easy to adopt, but it's doesn't really get us far moving forward. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I want to leave you all today with a little reflection out of Beth's boat book. Like I said, it's called Cry of My Heart. You can find it on Amazon, correct, Beth? Yes. It's beautifully written. It has pages in it for you to journal as well. It has prayer in it for you. And the reflection that she has here says, yes, trauma is hard. Therapeutic parenting is is exhausting and we persistently feel incapable. Will you permit yourself to laugh? Join me in praying for a sense of humor. And I think it's really sums it up beautifully. Yeah. Thank you for that. I look forward to it. So thank you to all of you listening today, wherever you are in the world. I hope that this message really resonated with you. If you are in the stages of infertility, if you're in the stages of waiting, if you're in the stages of licensing and your medical cupboard is getting ripped apart, continue to wait. Listen to Beth's message today. I hope it hits home for you. I hope that you find inspiration and, you know, just, I encourage you to keep going on your journey, wherever stage you're in. There is joy on the other side. You just need to keep going. Thank you for listening today and joining us on the Rise Today Inspirational Podcast. Ever so quickly, you can reach out to Beth at bethannagel.com. Thank you again for joining us. All the best, risers. Have a great day. It's going to be a good day. Thanks so much for joining us today. Take this inspiration forward. Learn more at risetoday.com forward slash podcast. And please do help us in our mission to spread hope, inspiration and positivity by encouraging those in your circle to join us and to tune in for our next show of inspiration coming soon. Please contact us if you have a powerful story to share with us to inspire the world. Until next time, get out there and rise today.